This is the Comics Alternative for Young Readers, reviews of Nightlights and The Best We Could Do. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative for Young Readers. I'm Gwen. And I'm Paul, and we're two academics talking about comics for young readers. And this week, we have two amazing comics that we're going to be discussing on our show. The first is Lorena Alvarez's Night Lights, which comes to us from No Brow Limited, and T. Bui's graphic novel, The Best We Could Do, from Abrams Books. We're also going to have an interview um, with T. Bui conducted earlier this week in Berkeley. Before we start today's show, I want to remind everyone that our program is sponsored by Discount Comic Book Service. Head over to DCBService.com for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. Every week, DCBS has DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles for 40% off, and many other publishers' comics regularly run between 20 and 35% off of the list price. In fact, DCBS has specials that run, Paul, get ready for it, 45 to 50% off the cover price. Whoa. <laughs> yes, and often the discounts are more impressive than that. So head over to DCBSService.com or to their sister site in Stock Trades for all of your comics ordering needs. Uh, if you're uh, doing your order this month, Discount Comic Book Service has a Marvel Kids bundle that includes issues uh, Marvel Universe Guardians of the Galaxy 19 and Marvel Universe Avengers Ultron Revolution number 10 for $2.98, which is 50% off the cover price. The DC Kids Bundle is also a great value. Looney Tunes 237, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You, number, 80, uh, number 8. And, 81, uh, actually. 81. Yes. <laughs> right. We're we much farther 81. along in the Scooby-Doo than I thought. <laughs> I thought there might have been a reboot in there. And Sco- <laughs> Scooby-Doo Team Up, number 26, for uh, $4.47. Again, uh, that's 50% off the cover price. So those are some great bundles you can take advantage of. Now you've got me thinking about what a Scooby-Doo reboot would look like. <laughs> <laughs> Scooby Doo Rebirth. <laughs> That's right. Um, when you do order with DCBS service, please be sure to tell them that Paul and Gwen sent you. Paul, we're featuring two comics this month that sit on really two opposite ends of the comics for young readers uh, sort of spectrum, if you will. One of them, Night Lights, is a wonderful book that probably is geared towards elementary age readers. But as we're going to talk about later, I could see how almost anyone with an interest in creativity would find something of real value and merit Mm -hmm. in this text. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum with Bui's The Best We Could Do. There we have a graphic novel that's probably most suitable, given its frank discussion of war and love and loss, for the upper limit of the Y category. Yeah, um, and, and I hope our listeners will appreciate that, you know, we are reading kind of a wide range. Um, a, as I shared last month with you, Gwen, I, I'm a dad of a six-year-old, and I think mm-hmm. Alvarez's Night Lights is a great comic for readers of her age. Although, as you said, there's a, a poetry and a, and a beauty in it that um, certainly makes it something that people of all ages, all ages can appreciate. Um, but also, besides being a dad, I'm also a middle and high school English teacher. Mm-hmm. And I'd say that um, Bowie's the best we could do. You know, it's, it's got a lot of a great merit and, and importance, as we'll discuss. But but I think its themes and also some of its language and imagery are are more appropriate for upper adolescents and and young adults. Although, you know, Gwen, I think it's it's so powerful, a book that... I might not be able to resist, you know, wanting to read it with my high school freshmen or sophomores, although I I might send home a a parent note first about some of its uh, contents. But um, right. Yeah, I agree. I I mean, I think some of it's regional, too. I easily, I think, could have have introduced this into my methods class for future high school teachers in the Bay Mm -hmm. Area with no trouble Mm -hmm. here in Michigan. I think we'd probably have to have a parent's note. But the the reality is that these topics and issues are very much dealing with everyday life issues that, you know, I think are important for young people to be exposed to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I'm excited that we're talking about this book. I think Derek and Andy on the main review show could 
uh, have rightfully claimed this book in their Tory, but we, we snatched it up because right. <laughs> it's so in. good. <laughs> so, um, well, I'm really looking forward to, to talking with you about both of these texts. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, Paul, let's start things off for the main part of the show by discussing Lorena Alvarez's Night Lights. It's a beautiful, hardback, picture book-sized comic that focuses on the early years in the life of a young girl, Sandy, who clearly has artistic ambitions and an abundance of creativity. (laughs) Um, However, Sandy also experiences doubts regarding the source of her inspiration and fears that I think all of us can relate to about what might happen if inspiration were suddenly to desert us. Mm -hmm. Um, I really love how Alvarez highlights and respects the creative process of a young artist, because very often when we think about, you know, people who grow up to become artists, usually any biographies or treatments of their lives usually start when they're a bit older than this Mm -hmm. protagonist is. But what Alvarez argues is that no matter what age you are, if you have a creative impulse, you're going to be negotiating with your imagination. You're going mm-hmm. to be, you know, working really hard to to be the best you can be in terms of um, a creative force, even when you're a little kid. And so I think that I, I can just immediately imagine that lots of young readers who would interact with this text would perhaps even feel relieved to find such a young protagonist grappling with these issues. Mm. So, you know, it's just, I think it's a really great, um, great text for, for young creatives, especially. But just a little bit on, um, Alvarez from yeah. her website. Um, she tells us that she was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia, and she studied graphic design and arts at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. She's illustrated for children's books, independent publications, advertising, and fashion magazines. And I can really see that um, mm-hmm. if you look at the, the the stylistics of the of the drawings. Yep. Um, since 2008, she's been part of La Procession Puppet Club, an experimental puppetry group of illustrators and visual artists. So she's also works in in three dimensions, which is exciting. Mm-hmm. So, um, <laughs> and Alvarez explains that she was born in a place full of colorful flowers and birds. And she even argues that the language of color is something that's important to her and is mm-hmm. definitely part of what she's trying to get across in Nightlights. And, yeah. and that is certainly true. Um, the comic is set in a city very much like the Bogota that Alvarez alludes to, where young Sandy rushes through her daily homework in order to find time to draw elaborative and imaginative pictures. And she often stays up late at night after her parents have told her to go to sleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't know anything about that, I'm sure, Paul. <laughs> right, <no. laughs> um, responding to the inspiration that comes to her in the form of night lights that sparkle through her darkened mm. bedroom. Yeah. Now, during the day, by contrast, she suffers through the curriculum at her all-girls <laughs> Catholic elementary school. And um, if any of you have gone to uh, to an elementary school where you've worn uniforms and that sort of thing, you will definitely see some familiar sights here. Mm-hmm. Um, and she often gets in trouble from her teachers. Um, the nuns get upset with her because rather than paying attention to her lessons, she daydreams about her drawings and her pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, and so far, this this sounds like a pretty standard text. Text, but um, an element of mystery enters the text when Sandy encounters a ghost girl called Morphe, which mm-hmm. I think is a wonderful choice of name, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, she becomes at first a confidant, but ultimately appears to come between Sandy and her inspiration. Mm. Um, and uh, in an interview with Matthew Tobin, Alvarez explains that, quote, in a certain way, Morphe represents the traps and insecurities you have to deal with when something you love becomes your job. 
I think it's a concern for many artists to lose their authenticity while dealing with the great pressure of staying relevant and to produce great things all the time to the pleasure and benefit of others, mm. unquote. So for the, I, I do want to say that for those of our listeners who have enjoyed Vera Broskell's YA graphic novel, Anya's Ghost, or who love Neil Gaiman's um, novel and graphic novel, Coraline, with its ghost children, you're certainly going to enjoy Nightlights. Um, there are many reasons to enjoy it, but I would say that if I were going to pair it with some texts, those might be ones that I would choose. And um, in all those texts, the presence of the supernatural encourages protagonists to think critically about their various gifts and emotional burdens that come mm. with those gifts. So yeah, I, yeah. I loved this book, Paul, and I'd, I'm really eager to hear what, what you and maybe your daughter especially thought about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, agree with your take on it and those texts that you said could couple really well with it. Um, you, you know, I think there's something to say about it, which is it's 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 a fun book. It's a beautiful book. It's um, it's bre- sort of breathtakingly beautiful mm-hmm. um, in its in its um, artistic styling and its rendering. But there is a certain element of it. And I think it's connected to what you said um, um, from from the interview with Matthew Tobin, where um, Alvarez describes the the way that insecurities, you know, become manifest as a, to to an artist, right? As, mm-hmm. as a kid develops their imagination, kind of side by side with imagination, is a certain awe and sometimes a little bit of fear. And and then there's this element of the story that's like many of those texts that you mentioned, like Anya's Ghost or or Coraline, where there's it's it's a slightly scary. You know, but, but mm-hmm. mostly it's, it's a kind of awe inducing, um, thing that, that I think speaks to the, the kind of runaway potential of both, you know, imagination and, and emotion that, that kids experience. Um, I, I loved this book, not only because of the, the sort of, you know, flight that it took you on, but also of how much it felt of a piece with, what I see in my daughter's experience and what I remember of my own experience of, mm-hmm. of being a, you know, a, a, a kid who drew all the time and was all lost in the clouds and, uh, often <laughs> stayed up late, <laughs> you know, making my dreams manifest in some way, you know? Yeah. And one thing I really like about this is that Sandy is at the age where she's beginning to understand a more nuanced or to have a more nuanced understanding of what mm. we sort of call good and evil. Yeah. Um, temptation, for instance. And I like the way Alvarez handles that in this text. It's not a preachy text at all. And in mm-hmm. fact, Sandy has to come to her own solution of, you know, to her problems. She sorts things out on her own without the help of any adults. And I always love those sorts of texts where a protagonist is faced with some sort of challenge and then manages to sort of look within dig deep and find some way to, to sort that out. And so, you know, there's a, there, there are a couple of scenes in the text where um, it's clear that Sandy, um, that, that imagination for Sandy goes beyond little butterflies and roses and flowers, mm-hmm. you know, the things that right. when I think most adults um, in, try to encourage kids to stretch their imaginations, they probably have a very conventional understanding of what that means. And, right. But if you're an artist, really from very early on, you're also aware of the dark side of things. And right. that's going to be part of your imagination, too. And that's what I meant earlier when I said I really felt like Alvarez respects young people yes. um, when she writes this book. Um, I, I'm interested, what did your daughter think? <laughs> well, first she thought that, um, and I think this is a, um, a an intended response that um, Sandy was a, a, a super cute and very likable protagonist. Yeah. You know, in the opening pages, just in the first two pages, um, she kind of establishes a, the, a, a tone of a kid. You know, the the first page is um, her drawings are spread around this. F- you know, around the floor, uh, which is a familiar sight in our household, yeah. you know, and, <laughs> and you get the sense of her being this kid who just loves drawings, intricate drawings and, you know, sort of wild imaginative, um, sort of creations. And they're just sort of, you know, uncontrollably all over the house, you know, and then, um, immediately her, her mom sort of says, you know, bedtime, you know, <laughs> time to wrap it up. And I think it just within two panels, um, she could, instantly relate to um, Sandy as a character and also the way that she's drawn is, is super appealing, which made it so that when we got to the point where uh, really in the third page, she's 
lying in the dark. And as you were saying, you know, these nightlights that she captures that represent her um, sort of her dreamlike imagination flowing to the next page where there's this huge spread. It was just delightful to see a kind of um, like Im- immediate uh, reaction from, from my daughter of, mm-hmm. I totally get this, you know, like, and the, the two page spread of all the creatures that she's sort of imagining and even riding atop, <laughs> as she's, I know. you know, there's sort of these, um, you know, different creatures that look like they come from Pokemon or never ending story or something like that, you know, right. and, and, and Immediately, her eyes widened um, in a kind of reflection of, you know, the sort of wide eyes of Sandy. And that was just um, gold. <laughs> that was, you know, dad reading with daughter gold because it, it's just that she immediately grasped from the visuals and from how, um, I guess, how how directly Sandy speaks to, um, you know, a kid like that at that age um, mm-hmm. that just got her instantly. So, that yeah, great. and that I, I think that, you know, even though she's absolutely adorable, she's not perfect. Right. Yep. Um, you know, she has flaws like we all do. And in that respect, I think that that is exciting, too. She it, part of the reason she has the adventures she does is because she does break out of the rules mm-hmm. and uh, want she, she goes off on her own and is really quite right. brave. Yeah. Um, and so there's a. But there is just also uh, a beautiful wonder about this text. It, it's it's unbelievably gorgeous. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, I'm excited to to let you know that Alvarez does have a website and she does sell prints from oh. her work. And now I'm thinking of what I'm going to put my little meager savings towards in the future <laughs> because her work is just stunning. And I, I know that it's always exciting to me when you know that a comics creator has such a strong command of color. In fact, yes. I'm looking at actually at page 37 and 38, which is a very sort of um, seminal point in the text where uh, Sandy is, we, we don't want to give too much away because we really yes. want you to enjoy this, but Sandy That's is right. confronting some things. And one of the things I noticed that really looking carefully at the the two page spread that that we're looking at here mm-hmm. the majority of it is it takes place at night and the the color palette is mainly purples and greens yeah. and mm-hmm. um there's sort of a a sort of misty sort of uh night lighty sort of a uh, feeling to it but mm. on the the left page in on the tree branch there's this tiny little orange growth Mm. And it's the only piece of orange, like definite orange that's yeah. there, except across the page, there's a few more of those. Right. But it's a very subtle little touch. It mm. takes up maybe, what, do you think, maybe 2% of the page in right. terms of, of what it covers. But if you look at the the right side, that color becomes an important mm. um, sort of highlight of, of something that's happening there. And yeah. it's just those little touches of sort of color that run through the spread that that don't draw your attention immediately. But if you really start to look at it, it's almost foreshadowing on the left side what is going to be the big moment on the yes. right side. So that's when, it, when I talk about color, it's not just that it's serving um, an aesthetic, right. which it's it is. I mean, it's a, it's it's serving an aesthetic imperative to a certain extent, but it also is subtly helping to forward the narrative. Yeah, mm. and I really love those little touches that that appear in the book that that yes. sort of draw your eye and and definitely this is a book that rewards a careful reader. Yeah, absolutely. And rereading it just kind of um you can it, you can you I you know I read it really briskly. We both read it really briskly cuz the the narrative is compelling, but it rewards just spending time in its pages. Um as you said, like I think the art I mean, I I I <laughs> will also go online and look for prints cuz as as just as sort of, you know, a single shot of art. It's amazing. But as you were pointing out with the, the sort that sort of burst of color, you know, growing into something, this is gorgeous looking art that's not just sort of standing still, but it's it's um done in the service, used in the service of really just really great storytelling, you know, and mm-hmm. um it's it, it, of a kind of a kind that um sets mood and like you said like uh, fires off little things that you notice almost in your subconscious but sort of burst forth later um and there's a sort of a plan planfulness <laughs> in that that's just um uh you know it's the kind of thing that i think 
uh, animators do when they make really great, you know, um, films, uh, mm-hmm. animated films. And that kind of um, level of, of, of thought and how evocative that can be is pretty remarkable to see in um, a sort of single authored, you know, comic or graphic novel. Absolutely. And then just one other thing from a technical standpoint that I wanted to bring up to our readers on pages 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. um, If you're interested in beginning to, to, if you're a young reader and you're interested in perspective and point of view in comics, Mm -hmm. or if you're an adult who wants to share this comic with a child, on this one spread, and it's just one of many, but there are at least four or five different angles that you are presented with. You you Mm -hmm. know, there's multiple panels, there's multiple layouts. Those layouts are doing some really interesting things in this, in terms of moving the storytelling along. Mm-hmm. Um, and Alvarez has said um, in, in interviews that I've read um, that she's very interested often in looking um, down on a scene and mm. giving the giving the, the reader a, a sort of bird's eye view of what's going on from yeah. if they were looking at it from above, which yeah. does one thing in the storytelling, right? But then right. there's on that same page that I'm referring to, there's also a scene where um, where the character is looking right at you. Um, yeah. You know that she's actually looking at someone else because you get that as the establishment shot. Right. But the reality is it you are then put into the point of view of the of Morphe looking at Sandy. And it takes a minute to sort of pick that up and then you are looking back at Morphe. And then on the the facing page, you have the narrative moving along in a really interesting pace, mm-hmm. and the the way that the panels are laid out um, really directs how quickly you move through. And then there's a point in the spread where you stop, and yeah. because the character has stopped and has had a realization, right. and so it's just it's really a technically brilliant comic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I. I can't speak highly enough of it. I've actually yeah. changed my um, changed my textbooks for the fall to include this in my <laughs> um, literature for the young child course. Oh, because, that's cool. Yeah, because I just really feel that there's a lot that I'll be able to do with my students. Um, you know, we talk a lot about reading aloud and right. um, how reading a comic aloud is sometimes different than reading a picture book aloud. And Mm -hmm. this is one of those comics that would help, I think would help my students learn a lot of the ways that they need to pause. And maybe Mm -hmm. even if they're reading it to a child to figure out ways to get the child to see how the panel placement is, is driving the narrative. And that's totally possible to do. I'm sure you do it with your daughter all the time. Um, but you're an experienced reader to children and, <laughs> and for someone who's just beginning, this is a great comic to start, I think. With yeah. That. And it, and it's great for, as you were describing, discovering those aspects of visual literacy that, um, you know, not to get on a, uh, on a soapbox here, but you know, when people, um, talk down about comics as sophisticated texts, right? The kind of, an, you know, being able to analyze the, the ways that, you know, whatever, s- semiotically or, you know, mm-hmm. through the way that the, the scene is framed, like on the pages that you're describing, um, so much is evoked, um, and so much is said, um, whether the, the angle of the shot comes from above or, 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 or level, or whether the panels are long or short. Those are things that I think you can, um, you know, I think a kid often reads it and grasps those things, whether, whether they grasp it instinctively or they just have a sense of it. Mm-hmm. But what's fun sometimes with, for instance, with reading with my daughter is we'll go back and we'll look at scenes like that and, and notice, you know, the ways that um, characters are drawn or how they're looking at us or they're looking at one another and how that affects our ability to empathize or our, you know, our imagining what's going on in their heads. And that's a lot of fun um, mm-hmm. uh, to do. And, and and I should also mention too, I think there's actually also, I think all of the visual brilliance uh, makes it e- easy to not notice the the brilliance that's in the simplicity of the language. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one moment to go back again to that, those very first pages, um, Sandy's mom says, Sandy, stop goofing around. You have a big day tomorrow. And Sandy lies on the ground and she says, 
I'm a heavy, heavy rock. <laughs> like, she doesn't want to get up. And that's just such a, like, you know, simple and minimal, but, you know, like, in no way is that dumbed down. That is so much the voice of a kid, but, you know, just expresses all of her reluctance to leave, you know, her, her, her drawing time, her drawing uh-huh. life. And so the language is also, I think, just, um, very artfully. You know, sort of tailored. And yes, I, and I think, I think really parents good. would enjoy that page a lot. <laughs> There's probably <laughs> something there that's that's very familiar to them. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really hope that that this is the first of many comics from Lorena Alvarez. Yes. Um, she's amazing. Yes, she absolutely is. Yeah, um, and and I should I guess I would also mention that um, the the sort of um, I forget the 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 right uh, way to call it, but the the look of the book, the the sort mm-hmm. of um, uh, production quality is uh, really great. And No Brow makes a lot of comics, you know, for different uh, age readers. But I think, um, w- you know, what I know them for best in terms of all all ages comics is is the Hilda series. And I think the Hilda okay. series has a similar sort of size and visual splendor um and it also has similar to nightlights this kind of adventure and wonder that's tinged with a little bit of weirdness <laughs> mm-hmm. when i read when i read hilda with my daughter there's a certain amount of like oh I, I i i gotta you know find out what happens next but i'm a little scared about what happens um and um and i think it's a it's sort of of a piece with that um that series also from no brow and uh if you know if that is a series um that no brow has been able to sort of uh bring to to press and i hope that uh, we see more from lorena alvarez as well this really is i agree with you a, a remarkable a remarkable book All right. Our, our second book, uh, Gwen, is The Best We Could Do. And um, The Best We Could Do is a graphic memoir that's published by Abrams Comic Arts. Um, and the creator, T. Bui, whose family came to the U.S. as refugees uh, in the wake of the Vietnam War, uh, t- she tells her family's stories in a narrative that weaves together history and reflection. Um, the book begins with uh, Bui's own um process of giving birth to her own child, uh, you know, the, her labor process, which is, of course, um, as, as it's depicted, astounding and miraculous and also terrifying, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think, but I think uh, she starts there because becoming a parent gives Bui a kind of new vantage point to understand and see her own parents. And so the book moves um, artfully from her, her present day taking care of her parents as they're aging to her, her researched accounts of their histories in, in Vietnam through change and conflict and then their family as they moved and eventually resettled, uh, uh to the U.S. and as we grew up in her, um, refugee immigrant family. Um, in, in some interviews that I've seen and, and, and read, T. Boyce said that this, she started this book 10 years ago. And I think, um, this is really fascinating that it was actually in wanting to tell this story, um, you know, uh, wanting to tell the story of her family that compelled Bui to learn and develop the art of comics creation and not the other way around. You know, I, we, I think we usually think of somebody who decides, I want to be a comics creator and then goes and figures out what their story is. Uh, but right. actually, yeah. um, in contrast, she, she knew these stories, obviously. And then she talked to her family and, and she researched to learn more and then decided that the best medium to tell the story was in the comics form. And I think that's really interesting. Um, she had studied art and, and law. Um, but she says that, um, she was learning to make comics as she was making this book, which is amazing given how expertly it's done. Uh, this is Bui's first graphic novel, um, but it, it's not like other, I think, other, you know, freshman efforts. She already teaches at the California College of the Arts and, and she's clearly honed her craft and also this book as a kind of a lifetime's work. Um, and, you know, one thing I, I'll share is that, um, Bui, uh, worked as a teacher, uh, uh, during this, this time and, and, um, prior to making this book. And, uh, she was actually one of the founding teachers of a school near where I work and live here in the California Bay Area. Um, a, a school called Oakland International High School, where a number of my friends and colleagues actually have, have worked. And that school serves a population entirely, um, of immigrant adolescents who come from really a whole world of, of places and backgrounds. Um, and, and that's not just the first, 
you know, that's not only the first reason that the book came to my attention, but it also reminds me of this, I, I, you know, I feel like a very awesome truth that um, immigrants and refugees, often they, sh- you know, they share a lot in common, and yet every person's story is unique and distinctly mm-hmm. human. And so when you read this book, um, Bowie's stories have has a lot of commonalities with other immigrant or refugee stories, um, especially coming of age stories, which, you know, you could think of Mouse as something like that, um, or something like Persepolis or Arab of the Future. Um, but also books um, like Maxine Hong Kingston's work or um, Viet Thanh Nguyen's uh, recent Pulitzer Prize winning book, um, Sympathizers. And, you know, and so similarly, there's a, a depiction of the tension and the distance between generations um, of immigrants who, who you know, grow up in different cultural frames. There's the brutalities of war or political conflict that you feel on a very personal level. Um, there's the ravages of discrimination um, coupled with the promises of opportunity, um, the need to reconcile with ghosts. All those themes are, are also here. But, but you know, I, I certainly wouldn't say that this book is is a formulaic immigrant story. Um, and I think there's a specificity in characters mm-hmm. like Bui's, Bui's, um, Bui's father's grandfather, um, who's both this philanderer and this, you know, real caring father figure. Um, and in the way that she um, depicts places like Hanoi, where we spend some time, uh, and all these kind of contribute to the feeling of a very unique um, and, and rich depth in this kind of self-revealing story, this memoir. Um, Gwen, I'm, I'm really curious what reactions this book inspired for you. Well, first of all, I just have to say that, you know, as a kid growing up during the Vietnam War, um, I was absolutely fascinated with what was going on in that part of the world. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I'm in my 50s. And so I was a little girl when the war began. And um, I was just entering, I believe, middle school when I believe that finally, the United States um, left the, the, the Vietnamese region. And so um, as a little kid growing up, um, so war was very much part of, of sort of my consciousness. I remember my parents tried mm. to shield me from it, um, asking me to leave the living room when the nightly news would turn to to the to news of the war. But what they didn't know, and mom, you're knowing now, is that I used to go into my room like a good girl, but then I would lie on my stomach and look through the heater vent. And that enabled me both to see and huh. to hear the news reports. And so even at six, five or six years old, I was gaining that information. I also remember um, as a kid, um, I read the Detroit Free Press in the morning before I went to school and then the Flint Journal um, when I came home from school and both papers utilized a graphic system of showing the war dead um, on both sides of the conflict. Um, each they, They'd show a little, a little grid with soldiers and each soldier would represent 10 people who had been killed. And so even from a very yeah. early age, some of my first math lessons lessons involved this war. And then as a teenager, many of the families in Flint who I knew adopted kids from Vietnam. Um, But of course, they were too young to have known what was going on in their homeland. And I didn't know any refugee families Mm. who had come over to Flint, although I know that there probably were some. Um, My neighborhood was actually an immigrant neighborhood, but people there had come from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe and so um, in Africa. So it was a different Mm. sort of mix. But as a kid, I was deeply curious about the Vietnam War. I found it, I, I, I certainly found it to be that the images of violence really were all that I had in my mind, um, all that I knew. And in school, this was not history that was taught. It was too current. I mean, I think even today, in most U.S. school systems, history stops right around the 1950s. Um, maybe there'll be a right. little bit of mention of the you know civil rights movement will go into the 60s or 70s. But but there's a there's a real hesitancy on the part of um, of mainstream U.S. publishers, teachers, etc., to necessarily go into depth about um, something that was really a major um, epic in American history, and that's why I loved this book. From my perspective, this book was educative. And um, aside from, I, and I want to talk at uh, you know at, at, at length about its its beautiful story, etc. But just from an information perspective, yeah. I recommend this book to anyone 
who has any curiosity at all, and you should, <laughs> darn it, um, about um, Vietnam and what um, what immigrant families and refugee families from that area went through when they came here. I mean, I my own, um, you know, inside out and, and back again is a is a really popular text that I know a lot of our mm. listeners have read. It's a wonderful um, verse novel, and you know mm-hmm. that that gives us a little bit of a sense. But this text really is um, is just profound in its ability to take us back, you know, um, into the childhoods of um, Bui's family, her mom and her dad, and. And it gives us it the the portrait isn't sentimentalized. Um, right. It's just extremely um, wrenching in a lot of ways and powerful. Mm-hmm. And I I loved this book. I'm so glad that um, that we have been able to uh, to both review it and to talk to the author artist. And I do agree, Paul, it's really exciting when someone becomes a comics creator in order to express a work. And one of the things that excites me the most is I've done a lot of thinking myself about representation and um, in mm-hmm. comics, especially, and some of my own research has focused mm-hmm. on on queer comics and the discussion that comics creators mm-hmm. have about what it means to depict themselves as um, individuals who identify right. somewhere in the queer spectrum versus versus drawing other people. And you know, we can right. representation can be respectful and unique, or it can it can move into stereotype and caricature. And what I love about this text is something right. that you know you said to me earlier, um, and I, I'll let you go ahead and elaborate on, but just the idea of how unique um, <laughs> this story feels and how unique these mm. characters feel and the amount of artistry that is be- behind this text. I mean, if, if I hadn't known, I, I just I just assumed when I first started reading it and wasn't entirely aware of Bui's background, I just assumed she was a comics creator who decided to tell the story. So, you know, it's amazing that this was mm. the story and she realized she wanted to be the one to represent her family's situation and in a way that's visually arresting and unique. And I just loved it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It is visually arresting. And, um, you know, it's 300 plus pages of comics or as it's called in the title, illustrated memoir, um, that is absorbing and immersive and, you know, parts of it very, very troubling in the best ways, um, and illuminating. Um, but you know, to, to what you were saying about, um, drawing, uh, memoir, um, I, I thought about this a lot when I was reading Fun Home, uh, by Alison Bechdel, which I, I wonder if that has some influence on, on Bowie as a creator, but, um, the, the act as an artist, you know, first of all, as you were saying, or as you were mentioning that the choice of the medium, I know that, um, Bui obviously teaches, but she also writes, um, and does non-comics writing. And I think she's working on nonfiction about, um, about climate change in Vietnam right now. Um, but, but, um, I think that, you know, for this kind of work, um, a, a work of memoir, a work of depicting family history, you know, I, I think about the kind of reflectiveness and, and in, in a way, self-awareness that the process of drawing, um, as opposed to writing has, um, must do to the creator, right? You know, every time that, um, she sits down, every panel that she sits down to depict her father, whether it was when he was a kid or, you know, in, in the current day or whatever, there's this act of putting brush or pen to, to paper and thinking about how you are depicting in a very concrete, in a very specific way, um, uh, you know, there's a deliberation uh, that I think sometimes language obviously reveals a lot, but also we can hide sometimes behind the abstractions of language. But for her to draw, um, you know, the city streets where her father grows up or the kind of emotion that he wears on his face as he must make a choice or, or, or whatever. Um, it, it's a way of, I think, stepping into their shoes that I think is, um, incredibly powerful. And in doing so, I, I feel like Bui has, um, sh- you know, shared with us, revealed to us, again, like these very specific parts of her family's history and her family's story that, um, uh, you know, as I said, that there's, um, 
I think there's a temptation when we talk about experiences or narratives such as, you know, a refugee story or an immigrant story to boil it down to a single story, you know, to say, oh, I've read a few stories or I've, you know, watched a 60 minute segment about this. So <laughs> I kind of know what they went through. Um, but, you know, the very specific configurations and the experiences, the way that things happening in the world impact their family, uh, all of those are you know, are unique and they, and they work out in, 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 in different ways. Um, and I think, um, Bowie's process of putting that in on, onto the page, uh, is, is just, um, I think r remarkable, revealing, very thoughtful. Um, and, um, and I think worth a reader's time. In addition to the specificity that you've just mentioned, there's also um, a, a sort of unifying experience that she references. And I'm thinking specifically of a panel that occurs very early in the narrative before mm -hmm. we right. as readers know her parents' background in, in right. their entirety. So thus far, we just know that um, that Bui has had her, her first child, that mm -hmm. um, it's given her this new way of looking at parent-child relationships. And there's a there's a panel that 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 I really moved me when I read it, but also led me to think about how this book would be of such value to young readers. Mm. Um, and it's on page 31. And it's um, just before we start learning about Bui's father. And mm -hmm. there's a picture of her following behind her parents as they walk down, um, you know, a very suburban kind of um, Northern California street. And <laughs> uh, the the narration, um, Bui says, I don't know exactly what it looks like when she talks about becoming closer to her parents, but she says, right. I recognize what it is not. And now I understand proximity and closeness are not the same. Right. And that profound statement um, is, is, you know, juxtaposed with an image of her mom and her dad walking in the front, and then she's walking behind them. And you first of all, get just the visual similarities between them, right? I mean, yeah, which as right. an author, she's stepping in to draw herself, and therefore is inscribing that similarity, you know, as she draws. So I think, again, that's right. one of the things that imagery does. But it also brings up something that I think when we think about young readers and why why they might read memoir or what mm. they might get out of it, um, for those of our listeners who are teens, um, I would say that, you know, when we're young, it's sometimes difficult to understand that our own parents were young once. And right. um, it's, it's difficult to even imagine even what that's like. So when you read a comic such as this, you see a, someone who's reflecting that same thing thing. When she's younger, she doesn't understand why her parents might do what they do. And but it's through talking to them as an older person, getting a sense for their stories, and then writing a text like this, that you start to see how the pieces fall into place. Yeah. I would say for older, uh, for older listeners, for our listeners who actually might be sharing these comics with others, um, <laughs> I, I could see how this would be a really revelatory comic to share because mm -hmm. I think it does provide young readers with a template for perhaps thinking about their own family situation, trying yeah. to understand why their parents might do some of the things they do. Um, there's a lot of empathy yes. that this book encourages in a yeah. generalized sense so that you have both this amazing specific story that could only be told by this author about her family. Right. But then you have that broader narrative that right. I think most of us can relate to because regardless of our background, um, we don't know, we will never know our parents when they were young. Um, yeah. and, and this gives us that chance to perhaps be a little bit more empathetic about maybe some of the choices that our parents make too. So in, just in general, I found yeah. it to be a, a really moving and meaningful text, I think, for all ages of readers. Yeah, yeah. You know, what you're saying about empathy, I, I'm thinking about what it takes um, to to empathize. And, and especially for as, you know, as we're talking about adolescent readers, as they 
grow in their understanding of the world and imagine other people's experiences and lives and learn empathy, a kind of mature kind of empathy. Um, and, 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 you know, empathy requires being able to understand things that are common and that are universal. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, knowing that just because there is a universality, that doesn't mean you, you can assume that you know, um, making sense of difference as well, you know? And so I, I mean, I think one of the big, uh, metaphors, uh, <laughs> metaphor is probably insufficient, but one of the big themes in the book is, is the, is the process of giving birth, right? right. There's a, um, a scene in page, uh, you know, it's near the end. I don't think it gives anything away, but, um, it's on page 273 and, um, it's, and her mother is giving birth in, in the refugee camp. And she says, um, in the, in the captions, the struggle to bring a life into the world is rewarded by that cry. It is a single minded effort, uncluttered and clear in its objective. What follows afterward, that is the rest of the child's life is another story. And I think that's this <laughs> incredible moment, right? Because it, it, it sort of brings us back. It echoes back to what we saw at the beginning of the book, which was, you know, the author, um, giving birth. And we're reminded that, you know, this is an experience that she shares with her mother, right? And all right. of the, all, and, and there's something about that particular experience giving birth, which obviously I've never done, but I've been beside. Um, that's, you know, you, until you actually, you can know all kinds of details, but until you're there, until the, the sights and the sounds and the feelings are something that you go through, you, you don't have, um, I, I guess it, it brings you to a new kind of ability to understand what you're, mother went what your own mother went through you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um or and and so there's something universal about that experience something clarifying about that experience but as it talks about that there's also but you know as a childhood goes on a childhood becomes filled with all kinds of other conditions and circumstances that make somebody grow up in a very different way and make somebody um you know difficult to understand for for another person who hasn't walked in their shoes and so that um that i think connects to to go back to the page that you were talking about where she's um sort of walking behind her parents and talking about proximity and closeness not being the same i think there's something in this memoir that um as you said i think we can all learn from in the sense of um the courage to you know bridge the gap of difference from with somebody like your own parents and try to understand where they're coming from and their experiences. But there's also something I think specific to, you know, an immigrant experience or, or, or a refugee family experience where that difference is something that you don't necessarily see uh, around you all the time. I know growing up as an immigrant kid, um, for me, understanding my own parents wasn't just a, generation gap to, to, Mm -hmm. to, to, you know, to cross, but also a culture gap. Right. Right. Um, and especially when there aren't a lot of media representations around you that make sense of where your parents grew up, what it was like for them to live in that time and place, how it made it so that they, you know, they react this way or, or, you know, what it means to them to, you know, to, say, I'm sorry, or I love you or not, you know, those kinds of really culturally specific things that, um, as an immigrant kid, I grew up feeling like I can't understand why my parents don't get it. It really was growing older and understanding their cultural frames and mine um, that, you know, allowed me to be able to empathize with them. And I think she does that, that this whole book is a kind of journey in that for her. um, That's that when I imagine reading it with many of my students who grow up with a similar experience that can be very, very powerful to watch and also to go through yourself. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I think marks this text as being very modern or very contemporary Mm -hmm. is that it doesn't hide some of the difficulties and challenges that are very real to the characters in this text. And I point that out because um, I I noticed, you know, in in texts that were published in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s that dealt with the immigrant experience, oftentimes authors were trying very hard to demonstrate that their family belonged. 
Yeah, and right. therefore, the stories that could be shared openly were very often either sanitized or were some some aspects of the experience were left out out of fear. Right. Selective, um, right. for, very selective. And <laughs> right. and what I appreciate about this text and many others of of um, you know especially that we find in the last uh, twenty or thirty years mm-hmm, has mm-hmm. been that willingness to to sort of explore those more difficult aspects of things, not to assume um, an audience that that one has to. Um, press or has to yeah. convince. And right. that that kind of, uh, when you were talking about sharing it with your high school students, you know, I taught in Cal State Hayward, which is now East <laughs> Bay. I always have to say that. Um, for only two years, but during that time, um, you know, the majority of my students were either refugees, immigrants, or were right. maybe first generation or second generation um, in, in California. Right. And at the time, the text that I had to share with them, this was in the 1990s, um, and a lot of the texts that were written for young people um, really did not always deal with that generational divide in a way yeah. that that is as, as realistic, I think, as compelling, as genuine yeah. as this. And, and, you know, I'm not trying to knock those earlier authors. They, they were right. dealing with their own re- publishing reality and audience reality. But I could see how if I were still teaching um, in California, or I could see how even with my own students here, this book would be such a relief in a way because yeah. it is so frank and, and genuine about um, about the family's experience and the I think that there's a lot of kids regardless of you know what what country what their country of origin is or where, what experience their parents had if they see that divide this text is I think really illuminates um, yeah. some of the 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 reasons behind parents acting the way that they do and and having the concerns yeah. that they do. Yeah, yeah, no, I I really appreciate that aspect of the book because like you said, um <laughs> growing up in the Bay Area and then going to Berkeley as an English major, there are these canonical texts of the, you know, quote-unquote Asian American experience. And um as as bu- Bui writes in the book, they're actually in the um, beginning of a chapter entitled Heroes and Losers. Um, she's talking about a specific incident, but she says there's no single story of that day, uh, April 30th, 1975, which is, of course, a, a signal day in Vietnam. But um, but I think that phrase, there is no single story of that experience is is really crucial. And as she goes on in that chapter to describe their specific experience and the kind of considerations they had to weigh as young parents, you know, experiencing, a, you know, kind of political pressure and um, eventually kind of, you know, exile refugee status. Her, her, her story is not like everybody else's story. Their family story is not like everybody else's story. And so pushing against this sort of, you know, um, uh, easy s- smoothing everything out as, you know, oh, this is what that, you know, all, all, all immigrants experience or all refugees or all, all everybody from Vietnam comes from it, 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 that I think that tendency erases everybody's individual experiences and all of the things that, you know, pushed and pulled them in different ways. And I think that kind of nuance is really important for um, for people to see. And especially when conveying history. Um, you know, it's interesting. Right. I just, last um, last semester, I taught a book that is not memoir, um, although it is written almost as if it were. And that's um, Sonny Liu's book, Charlie Chan Hak Jai, oh, which I love. love. And, you know, <laughs> right. but, but again, this is a book that when I taught it to my students, one of the things I said when I, and this was to graduate students, they were mainly right. young people. People twenty and twenty five and over, but but right. I said to them, you know, you're getting one view of Singapore history, right? And you know, Lou was very very clear about that. It's mm-hmm. one view, right. and yet it it opens up an opportunity for you to do more research and thinking. And I would say the same thing about this text. This yeah. is not going to be the only text that I read about Vietnam and the Vietnamese right. experience. And um, but it's one that gives me, as you say, at least one avenue. And the one thing that I really loved about this text was actually the way that um, Bui talks about history. Because, mm. you know, I think that most of us, I mean, I actually am the worst person to talk 
to about this because I love history so much that you're not going to have to do very much to get me interested. <laughs> but I will say that for some young readers for whom this is a new experience, um, yeah. I'm just looking at page 118, which is dealing with a very particular um, moment in the Vietnam Vietnamese mm -hmm. um, history and talking right. about um, how certain um, political and social movements um, solidified, etc. But right. even just the use of maps, um, the use of questions, like drawing in the idea of if this political thing had happened even slightly differently, my life would have been entirely different, yeah, yeah. Is, is really a powerful way to, I think, interest readers in history and to yeah. get them then to, to extrapolate from that something to think about with their own lives. And I think we're living in a political moment right now in this country where right. you can honestly say if one thing had gone one way, my life would be this. But it's gone this way, and so perhaps my life is going to change for these reasons. I don't think there's ever been an election in young people's lifetimes, right? People on 30 and under, um, right. where the, the outcome of that election is now very dramatically directing what happens because there has been a big shift in a lot of policies, some of which deal directly with immigration, as we know. And yeah. so people are right now <laughs> going through things that as they grow up and look back on this time will say, if things had been just a little different, my life would have been very different. And when I read right. that on this page, it on the one hand, it underscored the the sort of vibrancy of the way that Bui talks about history, but it yeah. also just kind of gut punched me a little bit thinking about all the young people reading this text. Yeah. For whom that sentence <laughs> means much more than it does to a 53 year old white yes. lady teacher in Kalamazoo, <laughs> Michigan. And you know, I I I was really moved, honestly, uh, by right. by this book in general, but that was another one of those panels that just made me stop, shut the book, and just think for a while about the the import of it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, you know, there's a lot of really good history interwoven into the story, but none of it um, <laughs> for somebody who is not as his history inclined as you, none of it bogs down the story. It all feels right. very powerful in the way that the political bears on, you know, really the individual and the personal experience of, of Bowie and her family. Um, yeah. I, and I think it's just really, really well done, uh, in, in terms of, of telling a story that doesn't, um, atomize or sort of just individualize somebody's experiences as if to say, you know, Oh, this is just what we went through. But to, to really show how the forces of, you know, um, politics and, and change, uh, revolution and war, you know, come to, um, it, you know, impinge or affect a, a family, you know, um, right. the way that they, the, the, the course of their lives. Um, it's really powerful in that respect. And just really briefly from a technical standpoint, the use of color is very beautifully rendered in this text. Yeah. It's, it's mm. mute. It's not, it's not, I mean, it's a bit of an antithesis to the first comic we yeah. talked about. It's not I was thinking lights. that too, right. Um, but, but color here is used um, in the way it often is in a memoir, um, sparingly, but yeah. consistently, and um, does some really important visual work too. So, so, you know, from the perspective yeah. of, of sort of just the comics technique, this is a really beautifully rendered text. Um, it's lovely to look at. And I Absolutely. must admit, I've only read it once and I read it through very quickly because I couldn't stop reading it. I was just yeah. drawn into the story and so moved by it. And I was just, I, as a matter of fact, I hadn't really set out to read it. I, I was sitting in my office. I planned to do some other things and I'd hmm, actually let's scheduled, take a look, right? <laughs> yeah, I'd scheduled a different day to read it, but I opened yeah. it up and well, that was it. I was that with the whole afternoon. I couldn't yeah. turn away. So, you know, I, yeah. I really recommend this. Is a is a really stirring, amazing, yes. meaningful, topical um, text. It couldn't yeah. have come out at a better time. Um, I yes. think we should be very grateful <laughs> because Absolutely. it's just so wonderful to have this text. Absolutely, and I I totally agree with you on it being compulsively readable. Um, I also agree with you on sort of the antithesis of Alvarez. Um, it's, it's very spare, um, but very expressive in its brush lines. Uh, I, one thing I thought was interesting technically to, to speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, the, the whole book is a kind of two toned, um, black, and then there's a kind of sepia, you know, orange brownish wash mm -hmm, right. that, that gets used, you know, that, that panel you mentioned with the map. You know, the map is rendered that way. Um, it often is used for background. Sometimes the characters are rendered that way. And I think that whole, um, you know, technique 
really creates a sense of memory and emotion that unifies the book. Um, and it's just really um, part of its poignancy is, is how, uh, how well it's done, artistically speaking. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely agree. Just the, the timing of this book is, is awesome. I um, usually don't like to project these things, but I'm, I'm, I'm expecting to see this on a lot of best of lists at the end of the year. And, um, and I think it's going to get some really good recognition that it deserves. Yes, and I really hope that that um, teachers who are listening to us will consider using some or at least some segments of this text in their classrooms. I think this would Absolutely. be a wonderful, um, wonderful eye-opening experience for young people to read about um, a story that um, is very specific to its time and place, but is also right. speaking to to our current time. Um, so Absolutely. it's just wonderful, right? <laughs> So we're glad now to bring you um, this interview that we did with T. Bui, um, creator of The Best We Could Do from Abrams Books. Uh, we had our conversation with T half in person and half over Skype. Um, I got to uh, meet T in person in Berkeley, California, and Gwen joined us on Skype. So here now is our interview. Yeah, we're, as you know, as Gwen was saying, we're super honored I feel super privileged to speak to you because we just uh, spoke about the book together, uh, the best we could do. And um, our, our review is glowing because we really appreciate it. We were moved and impressed. And um, so it's a great honor. Um, so thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the, thank you for reading it and review, reviewing it and, uh, and hosting me. Yeah. Yeah. Glad to have you. Um, I, I guess uh, we're curious how, how do you introduce the book to folks? Um, you know, you're probably going around to different places, promoting and, and talking to, to people. Um, so we've already told our, our listeners about, you know, the, the, the description of the book and a discussion of its contents. But, you know, what's your sort of a pitch about it? How do you tell the world what it is? I'm actually really bad at it, <laughs> which is ironic because I teach in an, in an MFA in comics program and I tell everyone you should have a pitch of your book. Right. But I think that if the, the secret is that if you actually knew how to describe your book in two sentences, you probably wouldn't need to write it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I usually hide behind other people's words and I let other people describe the book to their audience. And it's actually a learning process for me then. Mm because then I know what the book meant to that person. Yeah. I mean, it means a lot of things to me. Sure. But I could go on and on and on about it. Sure, sure. Um, I usually like to say it's not really a memoir. It's more of a, mm. it's a collection of stories about my parents mm. that needed a protagonist <laughs> and someone, a, a narrator to, to guide you through. Huh. So I volunteered myself. Right, it's, huh. it's not a memoir in the sense that I did anything particularly special sure. and wrote a story about it. Huh. Although I think it's it's very special in that, um, you know, y you don't um, write about your, yourself as if you were an isolated individual. You know, we all come from mm -hmm. uh, we, we all come in packages of people, um, yeah. and your family's <laughs> story is your your story in many senses, right? Um, as much as we all walk our individual paths, and it's fascinating to see. I think as the way that it's structured. Um, uh, is an interesting kind of example of memoir and what memoir can do because it's not only about ourselves but but the lives that we see and the people that are around us, right? Yeah, all yeah. of the the weight that you carry. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and so you you mentioned a little bit your process. Um, one reason that we wanted to talk to you is because besides being an an artist and a writer and a creator, you're also an educator, um, both of art school students um, and uh, adolescents. You you've been a, a teacher uh, and um, so as teachers ourselves, we have to ask first, how did you find the time? <laughs> Can you talk a little about your, your journey to creating um, the best we could do? Yeah, yeah. My students from my first years of teaching in New York will remember that I said that I was working on this book, <laughs> and then I got pregnant, um, yeah. and that I actually went on a travel grant, uh, travel grant funded research uh, trip to Vietnam <laughs> with my mother and retraced all of our journeys through Vietnam. Yeah. Um, and then I came back and I had all of these um, drawings to, and ideas to share with my students. Yeah. 
and I got them to do their own sort of oral history based comics. <laughs> um, but that was a long time ago. My son is now 11. Um, <clears throat> so I was raising him and teaching full time at a school in Oakland called mm -hmm. Oakland International High School that I started with a handful of other teachers from scratch, from mm -hmm. the ground up. Yeah. So it was a lot of work uh, that was not work on the book, right. but in some ways it was all the same project mm -hmm. because um, I was thinking, I was thinking the whole time. Yeah, yeah. So I drew a lot, I, or I tried to draw a lot, rather, on the side, on the weekends yeah. and school holidays, but they were mostly bad pages that I threw away. <laughs> Um, but I guess it was all, you know, just a process Necessary. of yeah. iterating and figuring out what the story really was. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear that because it feels like such a complete and mature work. But to hear that there's years and years of not only practicing pages, as you say, uh, throwing them away, but also a kind of dialogue process mm -hmm. with your students as you were teaching, um, and also with your research as you were sort of traveling, learning, talking to your family members and, and things like that. Yeah, it wasn't a, I will sit down and write out all of my thoughts kind yeah. of memoir. It was yeah. a, um, this memoir is giving me, or this book project is giving me an opportunity to explore some questions that I have. Sure. And the yeah. questions evolved, <clears throat> excuse me, over time. Yeah, yeah. Were there a few kind of you know, benchmark or, or watershed moments for you when the work took a certain turn that you could talk about? Sure. Um, my working title for a long time was a really bad one. It was called Refugee Reflex, right. or maybe just Reflex, but it, no, I always knew that it wasn't the right title because mm. it sounds like Reflux. <laughs> that, wouldn't, <laughs> that wouldn't be good at all. Um, and then I, I wasn't sure that it was just about being a refugee either. Uh, yeah. Um, and then, uh, I think it was, I can't remember when it was, um, there was a year when I was rearranging my life so that my parents could move to Berkeley mm. to be closer to me. I had, a, I had to find a place for my father to live mm. that he could afford. And yeah. then um, my brother and my husband and I were trying to figure out a way to build like a like an in-law unit in, in oh, our right. backyard mm -hmm. for, for my mother. Right. Um, and there was a lot of just, there. it was just a lot of work on top of, <laughs> the stuff that I was doing already right. to try to um, make room for my parents who are getting older yeah. to be part of my life. And yeah. that's when I realized that um, the book was really about parents and children. Uh, right. And then yes. it became the best we could do. Yeah. Yeah. That phrase, um, which I think anybody who reads the book gets the sense of um, I, all the weight of sort of years of life where you're trying to navigate you know, incredible circumstances in you and your family's case, and then to still make the best life that you can for your, your children. Um, that um, explains everything, you know, uh, everything that you do. And um, yeah, it's incredibly powerful to read, but is the, is the, um, could you talk a little bit about the, the title and sort of when you started to, um, to adopt the, the idea that parents, parenting, was at the center of your story. How did that sort of change the the way that you went about, you know, um, organizing and, and developing it? Um, <clears throat> the only time that I actually referenced the title in the course of the book is actually not from a parent at all. Yeah. It's, it's actually from a doctor at the hospital who's giving my mother the bad news that her first child has just died. Um, and he says, I'm sorry, we did the best that we could do. Um, so the title is also an acknowledgement, I think, of uh, the perspective of the child. Mm. Um, that sometimes the best we could do is not enough. Right, yeah. Um, but then the rest of the book is from the perspective of the parent right. who, mm. you know, did exactly that. And um, I don't want to lead people into like how how they should read the book, but for mm. me, um, that 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 contradiction or that that insufficiency yeah. is kind of life. Yeah. That you just have to accept it. That that uh, that often we fail each other. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and yet we are what we have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, it, well, we'll probably come back to some of those themes, mm -hmm. but if I could just kind of switch 
switch tacks a little bit um, back to your process. So we, we've read that you didn't so much start um, wanting to make comics as you did wanting to tell this story. Right. And that you decided at some point that the comics medium was the the way that you would do so. And, of course, we're wholeheartedly behind that idea <laughs> of being the comics alternative. But um, why comics as a medium for this story? Um, a lot of reasons. I think that the medium is really, really powerful, and I was excited that it was... Um, it seemed like still a new enough uh, area of literature for, yeah. to me that it was, it was exciting because it, I felt like um, there weren't all these traditions mm. to like have to learn about in some art history class because mm-hmm. I had just gone through uh, an MFA in sculpture mm. where I felt so much pressure to know all of these artistic yeah. movements that had come before me and that like I wasn't even able to do something without yeah. it referencing some other movement um, even though I didn't feel any connection to some of those movements you know because they didn't can have any people who looked like me yeah. Yeah. Um, so I felt like maybe I'd have a little bit more freedom in comics yeah yeah um, and then also I, I, I was really inspired by some comics that I read that mm. did an amazing job um, personalizing history hmm. what were some of those works that... well there are some of the seminal books like uh, Mouse by right. Spiegelman and Mar- uh, Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis right. um, and then I mean those books reached me because they had broken into the mainstream mm. right and then later on as I discovered or as I learned more names in comics and then I, I kept reading I've yeah. fallen in love with all kinds of other um, less lesser known yeah. authors yeah. Um, and, and comics creators but um, and then I another thing that I like about comics in general is that it it's still pretty lowbrow mm, right yeah and there's something I really like about that yeah yeah, the the cartooning community has been really welcoming and yeah. um, friendly and supportive. Yeah, in a way yeah. that um, I didn't feel in the New York art world. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People yeah. share their um, process and their trade secrets and, yeah. and all of that. Yeah, it, it occurs to me that um, besides the fact that comics allows you to work with visual art and language. Mm-hmm. Um, to tell your story, um, you made this as you were um, surrounded by kids from all over the world. You know, uh, yeah. Young, oh, oh, could I say adults? one more thing? Oh, about absolutely, why please. Comics? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other, so the other thing I was um, frustrated with, uh, like the fine art world, is I was thinking a lot about like what the end product of all your, right. all your hard work yes. is. And if you make these single singular objects, right. the only people who can afford them are people that you don't know. Yeah. Right. If you're me. In a gallery. Or exactly. Museum. Yeah. Right, right, mm-hmm. right. So I wanted to make work that my yeah. family members and my friends could actually afford to yes. buy. And yeah. so it was really important to then seek out the medium that is like, is reproducible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what's remarkable is that people young and old know and have a history with comics in a sense, yeah. you know, yeah. in whatever form and wherever yeah. they are from, anywhere in the world they feel yeah. more accessible to yeah. some people yeah yeah at, at the same time as they are maybe inaccessible because of certain biases about sure. books sure to other right people. right right but you get to break some of those biases with, i hope with so work like yeah. This. yeah 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 uh, that's great uh gwen I, I wanted to give you a, a chance if you wanted to jump in something here Sure. You know, one of the sections of the book that touched me the most was the section in the refugee camp. Um, and it's interesting because at one point you're showing your family having their pictures taken and then you actually reproduce the photographs Mm -hmm. um, that were taken at that time. And it was an interesting point for me in the narrative because I had become so invested in the family. And then to see those pictures, um, it just, it, it was one of many times when my heart broke just a little bit. And and I have to say that, you know, I know that you took a long time to write this book. If it had come out five years ago, I think it would get the kind of press that it's going to get, which is super positive. But it's coming out at a time when this is a very important dialogue that we're having as a country. And I wonder if you might like to talk a little bit about that aspect of the tax stand, whether or not even now you've been ask questions that you might not have been asked had had it come out at a different time. Hmm. Well, um, 
I mean, before the election happened, I was thinking a lot about Syrian refugees, and it seems mm-hmm. like there really isn't ever a time when we don't have a wave of refugees that is looking for a home. And so I was prepared to talk a lot about the connection that I see between myself and um, the Vietnamese boat people exodus in the 70s and the Syrian refugee crisis of today. Mm. But then, of course, now everything has gotten a lot worse because we're mm-hmm. not even taking in those refugees. Um, and now we're on the brink of another refugee crisis coming out of um, Somalia, Yemen, and Nigeria. Um, so to me, I don't know, the guy in the White House doesn't have a lot to do with with my comic. Um, it just means that I have to talk about my work with a little bit more force. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm older now. I, I don't see the book as so much an expression of my identity as, as, a, as a thing that I made. And so if people need me to um, put on my refugee hat and go around the country talking about why refugees are human beings, and actually I'm not trying to prove our humanity, I'm trying to help people hang on to their humanity. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I, I'll be the refugee. I'll, I'll talk as the refugee. That's, that's fine. If, if I can, I just want to be useful these days. So if that's what's needed, I'll do it. Yeah. Well, your your text is so so unbelievably moving and beautiful, and I mean, even for someone such as myself who grew up among refugees and immigrants, and is a very strong supporter, and I'm, uh, you know, obviously the product of immigrants uh-huh. <laughs> herself. You know, um, we, uh, you know, this book though just really touched me deeply and I'm just so grateful for it. And, you know, I think that I, I agree sometimes we don't ask to be put into the spotlight, but it just happens. And um, I'm just so happy that, that this book is coming out when it is. Thank you. <laughs> we were talking just before we started recording about um, some, some things that you've been doing with, with youth, with young people and in schools. Uh, and you brought along, and I wish we could show this, maybe I can capture a photo of it and we can sort of share it on our show notes. Um, we are Oakland International, a really, a book of, of really an anthology of comics that, um, your students created, that you guided your students. Could you talk a little bit about this amazing piece of work and also what you're doing now with, um, with printmaking and, and, and where that comes from for you? Sure. Um, so as an art teacher at Oakland International High School, um, my job was still to teach uh, students English because that was their primary um, need, being recent immigrants to graduate from high school and, and, and get jobs and go to college. Yeah. They really needed more than anything to um, acquire English. Um, so uh, texts, reading and, and, and writing and speaking were really, really important. Mm-hmm. And then also it was an opportunity for me to um, sort of teach a third language of comics. And, and I thought, well, maybe if um, if I teach them all some basic uh, um, conventions like right. speech balloons and captions, mm-hmm. then maybe they could communicate something that was quite complicated, which is their their history, yeah. and and surprise me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I didn't really know what I was doing at the time, honestly. Like my comics <laughs> curriculum from years ago was uh, based on assumptions that I had about making comics, and mm-hmm. if I have the time, uh, I will go back and and fix my curriculum <laughs> based on what I know now about making comics. Um, but uh, so the students, you know, uh, created over the course of a semester in my art class their immigrant story, yeah. immigration mm-hmm. story. Sure. Um, and they came from wildly different backgrounds, so it was a little bit hard to to guide them all through this very individual process, but right. all at the same time. But my classes were really big, like 35 students, yeah. 40 mm. students at one point. Yeah. Um, and then the editing process is really hard with English language learners, sure. too. There's a lot of editing. Um, but uh, we every year we published, um, we self-published uh, all of their comics as a book, mm-hmm. and I fundraised so that they could each take home a copy of the book. Yeah. And then after four years of doing this, we decided to make a, um, a, a sort of a best of anthology and yeah. collect a sampling of, of all of the different places that the yeah. students come from. Yeah. And we uh, fundraised even more to make a nice, a nice looking book. Right. And then... Um, the Oakland Public Library um, helped us and hosted a book launch. And, cool. And the mayor came and the students uh, signed her copy of the book, which right. they were very proud That's of. Amazing. And they spoke. And um, uh, 
and now we've, we're reprinting it because apparently someone is selling it on Amazon for two hundred dollars, <laughs> which we don't want at all. Um, the book is actually only twenty five dollars, and the proceeds benefit the school. Cool. How would how would people be able to look look for it when it uh, when it appears? Um, I think the best way is just to contact Open International High School or come yeah. there for an event. Um, the the ten year anniversary celebration is going to be happening. I think April eighteenth. Mm, okay. Cool. Um, and I think that there's a link to it from the school's website. Yeah, yeah. And the book will be uh, available there. Um, then, let's see, you asked about printmaking yeah. with the students. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, an amazing art teacher from there uh, named Brooke Toslowski, mm. who has um, been organizing with me on a, um, in a group called Print Organized Protest, mm -hmm. which is actually like a national network of volunteer um printmakers and artists mm, mm -hmm. and uh their goal is just to create these community events where people can bring their own t-shirts and right. learn how to screen print from uh professional printmakers right. mm. um, and volunteer artists who have like volunteered their own uh, protest designs and then sometimes we help people make their own designs too cool yeah on the spot and it's just a really wonderful like roll your sleeves up and create visual expressions of yes. how you're feeling in this political climate right now. Yeah, and yeah. then take those signs that you make to the next march or the next event. Yeah, yeah. So we're doing that with the students this Friday at Oakland International. That's amazing. I think that's such a powerful experience for them of, um, well, education in something like language or creation or art being, you know, wedded with their 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 urgency to say something as they hear and see depictions of you know who who we're supposed to be or you know yeah yeah i think that there's you know there's social media which allows you to to spread information quickly yeah and then i see a lot of students like they're starting to read more news and and repost more things yeah and share memes and stuff yeah. there's something really powerful about articulating what it is that you actually believe yourself. Yeah, yeah. And when you have to make your own block print, yeah. and you have to really think about what am I going to put in this? Yeah, um, yeah. I think it helps you figure out like how you're actually feeling and what you believe. Yeah, yeah. That's very true. Um, I, when I when I when I think about that and and doing similar things with students myself, one of the things that I run into, and I'm going to segue this into a question back about the book if mm -hmm. you don't mind, is that um, sometimes it's a tough negotiation for students what they decide to share with the public. Yes. Um, you know, there, there are things that are um, private. There are things that they are not sure if their family members saw them sharing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the most powerful things that they say are things that they then second guess themselves for having said out loud, if they're airing family yeah. dirty laundry, or if they're just, you know, revealing things about experiences that are difficult. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I want to ask you about, your process of doing research, some, mm -hmm. some of which you actually, you know, sort of show in the book. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess uh, I, th I think about um, Mouse and how um, Vladek Spiegelman is very forthcoming. <laughs> and I remember reading that in high school and wanting to do the same kind of project with my parents and my dad having no interest in telling me <laughs> stories as I tried to record them. Yeah. So, so how did you, I, I guess the, the broad question is how did you do research? But I guess there's many sides to that, right? In terms of the the brilliant way you depict the time and place, you know, and also um, eliciting the stories mm -hmm. from family members and choosing and and you know making those neg negotiations about what you share. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll tell a funny story first, and then I'll go into the serious stuff. Um, I. I put out this question to people on Facebook, I think, and I got a lot of responses from cartoonists um, about narration in comics. Mm -hmm. And some people don't like it at all. Mm -hmm. They feel like um, dialogue and action is where it's at, and that's right. what makes the comics medium more powerful. But the problem was, for me, I don't have... Uh, family members who are as vocal as Art Spiegelman does. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't have these like sort of New York Jewish family members who like just hash it all out right. in conversation. Right. I have my people. I like, hold it in, <laughs> and their silence speaks volumes. Right. Um, and so it takes a lot of composite conversations uh. to get at something, and then it also takes me narrating to, yeah. to tell you what's going on. Yes. Um, so that was what I had to do to right. the comics medium. Yeah. To yeah. get the story across. Yeah. 
I, I think that's part of why it feels not only so effect, effective, but um, for me, it was very relatable. It was very much, this is, there are, there are patterns that are very similar to, mm -hmm. to my family and to many families I know. So I think it was, uh, I think that was very well conveyed. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, I, I think um, there's an, another part where you're interweaving a lot of history and a lot mm -hmm. of um, even sort of the, the, the political history in, in Vietnam, as well as um, here in the States after you, your family has, has, you know, come to the U.S. Um, were there places where your research involved, you know, um, accessing visuals? You know, what did it look like in, in a place? Or, or was that largely from memory or your traveling? Um, well, since I left Vietnam when I was so little, I really didn't yeah. have any of my own memories to, yeah. to pull from. So a lot of it, I mean, most of it was asking other people yeah. and then having to verify the facts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, mo my, my mom remembers things pretty broadly, but yeah. my father remembers specific details mm. and facts and figures really well. Mm. So, um, you know, I would just have to make sure that the facts, like, I, I could verify them in a couple of other places before I put them down. Yeah. And the problem with um, facts and figures about casualties yeah. and wars is that even when I tried to verify them, I would find five different right. ones that were wildly different. Right. So in the end, I had to just, you know, use the quotation marks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or the speech balloons, right. <laughs> basically. <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, that the comics don't require the same footnoting that yeah. other decks do, which kind of gives you an out in that sense. But they do require you to, like you were saying, conjure up what a place looked like that may be right. very faint in memory. Yeah, um, that was really hard. Because yeah. I think if I had just written in prose, I right. wouldn't have had to do so much visual research. Right. But I realized that a lot of these places, um, I would have to actually figure out what they looked like. Yeah. So there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of work that doesn't, I think, look apparent to most people. Right. Right. But like I drew the floor plan to our house in Vietnam yeah. multiple times to yes. get it right. Yeah, yeah. I left Taiwan when I was very little. When I went back as a teenager, uh, it was weird to sort of see these places that I hadn't been in in years. Everything was a lot smaller than I remembered yeah. because I was smaller when I was in there. But yeah. just that the sense of what the streets are like and, mm -hmm. and so on, uh, it would be hard to capture without, you know... Reseeing it, so yeah, and you don't want to make it up based on right. you know a Disney movie that you saw. That's or something. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Listening to you both here, I'm so reminded of Joe Sacco's comments on mm. how hard it is to do nonfiction comics. Yeah, right. You know, and and the due diligence that you have to go through to feel comfortable that what you are representing is as accurate as it can be. And so it's it's really interesting to hear this. Mm. Yeah. Sacco's a, a, a great example of, as he, I think he says something along the lines of, you know, sometimes the way he cartoons is because he's trying to be as accurate and precise as possible, but he needs some exaggeration to cover for sort of how much is lost, how much he knows is lost yeah. in what he's mm -hmm. seen and what he's drawing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. Um... There's a lot of going back and forth with my parents. I'd draw something yeah. and show it to them and say, "This does this look right?" Yeah. And it was it would be about something really really specific and small, like a somebody's hairstyle from the 1940s, yeah. what they would have worn, yeah. what kind of shoes they would have worn or whether they were barefoot. Yeah. Um what kind of uh cooking element my mom would have been using. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and that's th that makes me think that you know, it's hard for me to imagine a work like this taking any shorter than 10 years <laughs> because it seems to me that along the way of making it it's a journey for you mm -hmm. as well you know in terms of um that evolving conversation mm -hmm. with your parents which you you know show uh in the in the story um all of that seems necessary to, yeah. to for it to become what it ultimately becomes sort of drafts that are shared with the subjects themselves and yeah, I yeah. don't think I would. If I had to do it again, I, I'd probably still take as long. I mean, <laughs> I hope I won't take as long on the next book. But, yeah. you know, when I met Joe Sacco, mm. it, um, I had just started, I think I had just self-published the first chapter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which has changed a lot since then. Mm. 
Um, but I got to talk to him a little bit, and I, I think I felt the pressure to, to get the book done as soon as possible, um, just because that seemed to be what other people were doing. Right, right. And he looked at me and he said, I think you're being a little hard on yourself. Mm. You might want to give yourself twice as much time. Mm. And I probably ended up taking it, taking four times as long. <laughs> but that's just how it goes. Yeah, it, 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 uh, it shows the work, not in the sense that it's... Um, I, it's 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 a work that's sort of matured beyond any anxieties in, the, in that sense. Yeah, my my sister says it's dis, it's distilled, and yeah. that seems that seems about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got some high quality whiskey in this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we that's what it felt like to read it <laughs> in the best ways. Um, I have a few more questions, Gwen, but I wanted to see if you wanted to jump in here. Well, just from a technical standpoint, I wonder if you might want to talk a little bit about your choices regarding color. Mm. Mm. Um, well, the the book uh, was meant to be black and white, or at least that's what the contract said. Mm. And then I asked, kind of late in the process, could we have, could we try duotone, um, or maybe add one color? And then it was just like a budget question of mm. whether <laughs> whether they could afford it. <laughs> Um, so it turns out doing one spot color plus black and white is is totally um, economical. Is that the word? It's cheap. It's <laughs> yeah, cheap. <right. laughs> um, um, but then it was just a matter of like making sure it was on the right paper and then choosing the, the exact right Pantone color. And I went back and forth between graphic novel blue, which I decided <laughs> not to do because I, I never saw the book as being blue. Um, I always wanted it to be brown of some sort, but you know, brown is really hard to make look good. Yeah. Um, I tried something that somebody who does a lot of risograph printing told me, oh, that looks like Rizzo gold. Mm. So I was like, oh, well, I guess I can't do that. <laughs> um, then something that was red in the, ro- in the like parts where it's more transparent mm. looked too much like blood huh. or it looked pink. So I was really, really happy. Um, when I, finally found a yeah. color that feels a little bit like the dust that comes off of yeah. bricks. Yeah, yeah. That felt like Vietnam mm. to me. Yeah, something between the ra- red and the brown, Yeah, as you were describing. Um, yeah, we commented on that when we were reviewing the book. That that the And did you do that with, um, you know, on, uh, digitally, or was it um, on paper media, or how did you sort of create that? Um I, it's, it's all digital coloring. Mm-hmm. I, 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 at the beginning I was, um, doing black and white ink washes <laughs> or gray ink washes straight on to my line work. <laughs> and actually some of those pages are still in chapter two. Okay. Those were really hard to cover, to color and also to fix errors right. on. <laughs> um, so just logistically it was easier to, to color digitally. <laughs> and I was really short on time towards the end, <laughs> but I, um, I also, tapped my friend Jake Wyatt, who's oh, yeah. a master of Photoshop, mm-hmm. um, for just ways to add texture and make it look as much as possible like it was done by hand. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I taught myself how to use the Wacom tablet right, right. <laughs> very late in the game right. so that I could add color to this. Yeah. it's I'm remarkably effective. I mean, I think just the right sort of, this is the wrong word, clearly, but the right pitch of color. Okay, for good, the, to good. the tone of the story, absolutely. Phew, that's amazing. <laughs> I started in the middle of the book so that you wouldn't notice that I was learning as I was doing it. No, that, none of that shows, uh, or it, it, it shows how, how well it came off. <laughs> well, the the other reason for the best we could do as the title is that that's, it's my built in my built in disclaimer. <laughs> this is not a work of great mastery. It's a work of trying stuff out and just you know making do with what you've got at the time. You know, w- yeah. with where you're at. Yeah. yeah, that is something I learned from being a public school teacher. <laughs> well, you fooled you fooled all of us, you know, and that's that's a uh, a lot to show for. Um, I guess uh, that might dovetail into the, this. One of my last questions is: a lot of our listeners are our teachers, our um, librarians, our parents, um, but I think a lot of them are also aspiring creators and and probably ones who would love to create a work like this. And so, is there you know sort of encouragement or advice that you give someone who admires work like yours, or or maybe something that you wish you could have you know traveled back in time and and tell yourself if 
five, ten years ago? Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, one of the best things that I did for myself was take three weeks off to do a comics residency mm. uh, at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. They, yeah. uh, they, usually br- they usually do sort of fine arts and performing arts, but right. they decided for the first time to bring together three um, comics artists, mm. and then they each uh, accepted eight like emerging fellows to to work with. Yeah. So I went there to work with Craig Thompson right. and then there was Paul Pope and his group yeah. of people and Svetlana Shmakova cool. who now goes by Svetlana Delahanty, I think. Mm-hmm. Um it was amazing to spend three weeks working on comics with people who do this all the yeah. time. Yeah. Um my boss wasn't really happy with me because it was in the <laughs> middle of the school year. <laughs> but um, you know, I just made sure that I had left good lesson plans yeah, right. good and, and, had, and, and yeah. had, had a good substitute. Yeah. Um, that really changed things for me because huh. it was it, it was the shift from working in isolation on weekends and school yeah, holidays yeah. to actually having a community to support me yes. that actually knew what the medium was all about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, some of the people that I met then, that was in 2010, mm. are still my close friends now. We, with that amount of time, adults don't usually have right. time to play right and really invest themselves in their side projects that's right yeah and so i think that having that time really cemented Mm. these relationships that you know have supported me throughout the book yeah yeah that's that's amazing to hear to to you know have the advice of a community that sort of continually fuels your growth and your learning and yeah sort of pushes you and you, you sort of elevate um your own your own practice alongside them yeah you need to input i think as educators we're so much about output and helping other people learn and and take in stuff but we don't we don't nurture ourselves yeah and and you need to if you're going to make a book yeah yeah that reminds me a lot of um of of gene nguyen yang who i've spoken to before about how you know he was teaching at the time as well and had a group a sort of weekly group of friends that he got together with and they would um, make comics together, you know, and uh, how necessary that was for his process. Yeah, I really admire that. I tried to do that, but I'm just not very good at the the unstructured uh, weekly groups. You know, <laughs> right. I just end up going and drinking beer and socializing, <laughs> and I don't really make comics. Right. I have to actually fully in- immerse myself in something. The three week retreat is, is yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah, really good for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'm yeah. trying to reproduce the experience in small ways right now with. Um, the, this I, I try to get cartoonists to go camping because I, I think it's funny. <laughs> One, I think it's funny, and two, I, I really love camping, and I love <laughs> cooking while camping. Uh-huh. So um, there are some kind of cartoonists I just can't get to go camping, but other ones <laughs> do. Um, and I feed them amazing food, and we get to be outside in you know the redwoods, yeah. and um, we have fun. Yeah, and it 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 help. It's it's it, I did it for the first time last year, and That's it was. Cool. Um, it was amazing. So we're going to do it again this this summer. Yeah, and 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 good because you remove from all the distractions, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. And you're sort of isolated with your pen and paper and whatever. Right. But um, oh, I find that so funny because yeah. nature is so distracting to me. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> is it fun- is it funny because cartoonists aren't natural out- outdoorsy people? <laughs> <laughs> There is, yeah, there are cartoonists who are actually down with nature, and then yeah. there are the ones who um, freak out a little sure. bit about the bugs. Sure, um, I'd be hiding in the car. <laughs> <That'd be me. laughs> That's awesome, yeah. So um, maybe you could talk about what you're working on now, and, and you know, for, for all of us who, you know, now know T-Boy and are, are going to be excitedly anticipating what's next for you. <laughs> um. Let's see. You can probably expect some more online political comics from me. Cool. So I put out a couple um, quickly in January because I had a lot of feelings sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> between the election and the inauguration. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's there's going to be some some more of that in the works. Cool. I think I probably have some things to say about public education yeah. that need to go up soon. Yes, yeah, it is a time for that. And where, where do people find that? Um, well, there's one comic that I did about uh, early political activism or like, you know, getting started with political activism on the NIB. Mm-hmm. Um, the NIB gave it the title, Fear is a Great Motivator for Political Action. <laughs> that It's not as Machiavellian as it sounds. <laughs> it's just, it was I was making a joke about how... You know, I'm terrified, but right. actually, fear is a good motivator for me. Right. <laughs> um, 
And then the other comic that I made uh, was about refugees, um, and it's uh, on Pen America. Uh-huh. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and we'll also um, look out for We Are Oakland International um, new new printing of that of that work by uh, your students, which is I'm looking at it now, and it's so cool to see students um, telling their stories and really. As, as was the case for your students at, at your school from all over the world, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And Yemen, Mongolia, Russia, Liberia, um, where else? Uh, El, El, Salvador, El Salvador, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, and Burma, Burma slash Thailand. There were refugees who had lived all of their lives in a refugee camp on the um, Thailand side of the border, mm-hmm. but they were originally from Burma. I think this would be really powerful to show my students, to have my students study in terms of, you know, what what comics, what you can do um, in comics to, to tell your story. This is a text that I actually used. It was cool to um, then use the book that we made as a text in another right. class that I taught. Yeah. So the kids, after um, telling their own story a lot, I wanted them as uh, older students as 11th graders to actually use it as research yeah. about a group that to which they didn't belong yes yeah so when they were making documentaries wow. um i purposely had them study a group someone else's history yeah um and they did interviews with people but they also did research ahead of time that's by, cool. by reading these stories among other things that's really cool and and of course we would encourage um all our listeners to pick up the best we could do <laughs> yes please. yeah yeah, it's a, it's a it's a brilliant brilliant work. Um, Gwen, before I wrap us up, do you have anything else to ask or add? No, just really want to say how much I enjoyed the comic. I actually used to teach at what used to be known as Cal State Hayward. Um, <laughs> now it's called California State University East Bay, but right near where Paul is and where I know you are and. I'd say probably 60 to 70 percent of my students at the time were either recent immigrants to the USA, were refugees, et cetera. And it was so exciting teaching multicultural adolescent lit to that student population because in many ways it inspired them to do their own work. Um, you know, and, and I'm wondering, do you have any students right now who you think are future comics creators, people we <laughs> might be reading based upon both their, their talents and their, their experience? Um, I don't know if they're going to be doing comics, but, um, they're definitely telling stories. There's one, um, former student who, um, is a poet and also has a love of comics and music. So I'm, and, and skateboarding, um, and graffiti art. So I'm actually not sure where his expression is going to land, <laughs> but it's going to be amazing. He's from El Salvador and his name is Miguel Melendez. Mm. Um, and actually I'm going to, uh, be reaching out to him soon to do an event with me at the library. Um, and then there's another uh, amazing student of mine named Yasser Alwan, who's from Yemen. And he is, he's like the next Stanley Kubrick. I don't know. He's got this <laughs> eye for cinematography mm. that is just in, unique and uh, amazing. The movies that he made in my class with a flip camera yeah. were incredible and then as we would get him better equipment um he just would always um take any exercise we gave him to the to an artistic level you know he he made homework art um so i'm also hoping to get him to do an event with me um and then there was a student named uh helen gabriasis uh who is from eritrea i believe originally and then uh went to sweden and then came to the u.s to join her father um, who's an amazing photographer, um, mm. and also made an incredible documentary in my in my uh, class, who I would also love to um, bring together in this um, event that I'm trying to organize with the Piedmont Library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're super lucky to be surrounded by really, you know, people who um, are genius level from from all over the place, and to watch them emerge as young people, which is what we get to do. Um, as educators, and uh, I think Gwen and I feel super lucky that we got to read this book and to, to talk to you. Thank you so much for having this conversation with us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, 
Paul, I want to thank you so much for arranging our interview with Deep We. It is always exciting to hear comics creators discuss their process and their inspiration. Yeah, and we want to thank um, Miss Bowie as well as uh, my Bradford from Abrams for setting that up for us. And um, wow, what 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 fun! Um, so interesting to talk about um, both of these works, um, as well as to talk to uh, to the creator of the best we could do. It's really good to be in the comics alternative young readers universe, isn't it? We're, we're rocking <laughs> it out great. here. <laughs> well, I'm loving it. on to more practical matters. Um, we, <laughs> want, we want to remind folks to visit our sponsors, um, our sponsor DCBS Service and their sister company in Stock Trades, where you'll find lots of amazing comics priced at anywhere from 20 to 50% off list price. And after you do get your comics there, please feel free to get in touch with us and let us know what you think about the books that we've discussed today. You can contact us by going to our website at comicsalternative.com. And on the right-hand side of your browser, you should see a tab that reads Send Voicemail. And if you click on that from the comfort of your own desktop or mobile device, you can send us a message through the wonders of SpeakPipe. Or if you want to go old school and go to that phone that you still have on the wall and pick it up and dial, um, you can <laughs> reach us at 4153Comics, which is 415-326-6427. Or you can contact us by email at twoguysatcomicsalternative.com. Or you can get in touch with us individually. I'm Gwen at comicsalternative.com. And Paul, how can people reach you? Uh, they can reach me by Telegram. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you can reach me at Paul at ComicsAlternative.com. You can also find us on Twitter, uh, where we announce new content to our podcast and updates to our blog. We, we are at Two Guys with PhDs. That's the number two, Guys with PhDs. Um, Comics Alternative is also on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, and Pinterest. And um, I, I, I don't think we've left out any significant social media platforms. Uh, maybe Telegram. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel, so you can access us that way. And you can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. And you can stream us on Stitcher. Or you can find us on TuneIn and Spotify. I think we need to have someone who knows Morse code send us a message. Uh, <laughs> to us. But anyway, um, you can also discover every single one of our episodes, as well as our reviews and comics-related commentary on our blog at comicsalternative.com. So until next time, I'm Gwen. And I'm Paul. And we want to wish you a great month of comics reading. <laughs>